Hello, welcome to another edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace reporting live here at Smoke here in New York City. Tonight, pianist George Cables is performing selections off his brand new High Notes record release, My Muse. And for over the last 45 years, he's been one of the most in-demand session pianist, composers, as well as accompaniments. He has backed the likes of Dexter Gordon, Freddie Hubbard, Woody Shaw. The list goes on and on. Tonight I sat down earlier and we talked about his career, him growing up here in New York City, how he got exposed to jazz, and also what his take is on being a successful composer. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the sounds of Mr. George Cables and his quartet live here at Smoke here in New York City. <laughs> George, congratulations on your brand new High Notes record release, My Muse. And I understand that you wrote three compositions in regards to your wife. Yes, uh, Helen and I were together for about 28 years. Uh, uh, she, wasn't really my, my, she wasn't really my wife uh, legally, but she was my wife in spirit. I mean, we were partners uh, for 28 years. And uh, yes, I did. There's one song called Lullaby, which was the first song that I wrote for her in, back in the 80s. And then um, uh, Helen's song, which a lot of people, many people know. Uh, and then a new song called My Muse that I wrote after she passed away and uh, uh, I just cleaned out the, the place, the apartment, the San Francisco uh, apartment and uh, uh, getting ready to, to leave but I had to stay at some friend's house. Well, uh, make a long story short, my flight was canceled uh, because of the weather and I had to wait six days 
uh, to get another, another flight on that airline back. Uh, so I just stayed. I was in a good place. I was in very good friends' uh, home, and they were away, so I had to run of the place with a couple pianos with a nice Steinway grant. <laughs> so uh, I was messing around and playing with the piano, and I decided to write My Muse. That kind of happened. It's a kind of a happy song. It's uh, dedicated to Helen, and uh, 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 she was a kind of a a great spirit, a great woman. Uh, and you got two of my favorite people in your trio on this album. You got Mr. Victor Lewis on drums and Essiet Essiet on bass. Oh yeah, they're two of my favorite people too. Uh, we've had we've had I have a history. I mean, we've recorded some things before. Uh, and uh, played a lot of music together before done the tours together, but we have a musical history together. Uh, I can remember, I, I, especially Victor, one time we did some many many years ago. Now we did work with Dexter, but I think I don't know if this is before then or what. But uh, we did uh, had a gig in uh, Seattle at the Jazz Alley, and uh, well, this is when they were doing like two week gigs. You know? And it was Victor and, uh, oh, I just can't think of the piano. The bassist was a bassist who worked with, uh, with uh, Bill Evans. It was one of uh, the things that he's known for. At any rate, um, Victor, I remember playing uh, I Mean You. And, uh, you know, I kind of expected what, uh, what we usually play. I just called the song. And Victor came up with something that was so creative. I mean, I just, uh, I loved him before that, but I really loved his mind and his creative spirit and what he was thinking of him, his uh, de musical dedication then, you know. I was, uh, that's something, one of those moments in life that you never forget, you know. <laughs> Cable's story started, and from what I understand, you 
really started off playing piano and you were classically trained, but you didn't get into jazz until much later. That's correct. Uh, I went to the high school of performing arts here, and I met some uh, young people here that were uh, there that were into this music. You know, gradually I, I heard Little Bird, I heard uh, uh, Dave Brubeck's Take Five, and then at school, I said, wow, that's good. And then. Uh, um, uh, Art Blakey's drum suite, you know, I went out and bought that record. That was one of the first jazz records I, I ever owned. And uh, that was with, uh, I think, Oscar Panovit and uh, uh, Ray Bryant on one side, and Art Blakey, of course, and uh, 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 with different drums. On. And then the other side was with the Messengers, you know, and Jackie Mack and uh, uh, Sam Dockery and the guys, Bill Hardman. You know, so it was, uh, that was a, great, a very important record for me. But um, I met someone at, at the high school that turned me on at Thelonious Monk with that, his town hall record. And we used to listen, I get turned on. I got my, and I got my first definition of how do you improvise, you know. And it was a simple, it was a simple definition. You, you play the notes of the chord and the, the scale, you know, this, play the song and play the structure of the song. Okay, that was the simple explanation seemed to be the best. So I first got my, uh, to learn a few things to listen to. Uh, and uh, I actually tried, I got a tape recorder and tried playing uh, um, uh, Autumn Leaves in E minor, where everybody plays in G minor. I played in E minor, like that was on the sheet music, uh, um, for myself, by myself in my basement, you know, and then turned it back and played it back and listened to it. And, uh, you know, later on I listened to that. and. I, all by myself in my basement because I wasn't going to let anybody else hear before I did. And I, I'm sitting there by myself and I was embarrassed with nobody, <laughs> nobody listening to me. But um, that was the beginning of my interest. And being here in New York, you know, there are a lot of musicians. There are some guys who went to music and art. And later, after I graduated, I started to get into this music. I mean, I started to, to think about playing, but I heard Billy Cobham, who went to music and art, and uh, some other guys, this guy named Artie Simmons, and uh, Bernard Scavella, and Leroy Barton Jr., whose father got us into the union, was the first black union official in 802. Uh, and... Um, uh, they they uh, kind of turned me on, and Artie was uh, the cousin of, or nephew, cousin and nephew of Roy Haynes, so he would come into the basement, and uh, to Artie's basement, and listen to us, and sometimes play. So that was inspiration right there. But uh, maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I, at 18, it was the legal age in New York. So um, at that time, you, I mean, you could go into a bar and drink or whatever. So I could go to the five spot and hear Thelonious Monk, who was there for four or five months at a time, the lone, and with uh, maybe Mose Allison playing opposite him, double bill for four, you know, for months at a time. It was like a steady job. Um, and I could go hear these guys over and over, and they in turn could play this stuff over and get really tight and look at this music have different perspectives on on the music that they play so that was a great time and a great uh, those clubs were great for that uh, and if it wasn't uh, Mung, it was Mingus with his band I first heard the Mingus with uh, with Eric Dolphy Eric Dolphy was playing uh, then and that was the only time he died soon after that but uh, Jackie Byard would play piano, and then he'd pull out his alto and play <laughs> alto. I'd say, well, wow, man, how many instruments do these guys play? So uh, all this was a great experience. Uh, and I was really getting into music, and it was something about this music. I wanted to be a part of it, one way or the other. Um, and I, I, it, it didn't have to be a leader or anything. I just wanted to be a part of it. I wanted to be a good sideman, a good band, you know, especially after listening to Miles' band. You know, that was the thrust of my ambition, was being a, a, a very good sideman. Also, what helped me, you know, I, I did 
I, I don't know if I should tell this story, but uh, I, I was sitting watching Mingus, and when he got off the bandstand in the five spot, he went down to this table, and he sat there, and he had a bottle of wine, he got a bottle of wine, and not a wedge of cheese, but a wheel of cheese with, the, with one wedge taken out. <laughs> and the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. See, I said, man, I want to do this for a living. If this is, these are the perks, I want to do this. That was one of, one of the things that, uh, that helped me decide or, or uh, uh, motivated me to uh, get in this music. I mean, really, it was the music itself, but that other stuff didn't hurt. George, your role over the last 40 years, a little over 40 years, has been composer, pianist, as well as accompanist. And, you know, one of the things that I, uh, I think that needs to be addressed are your compositions, because in addition to you playing with some of the icons and you being in that class of icons as well, your compositions have been played by the younger generation of jazz artists. That's a real compliment. That's something that I, I'm really thrilled about. I love when people play my, my, my music. Uh, and uh, vocalists, some vocalists have done, have done uh, some of my pieces as well. Woody Herman even, Woody Herman's band played some of my pieces. That was a big, big one for me. I mean, I was, I was shocked at Woody, at Woody. I mean, Woody, Woody's played uh, music... Uh, of Stravinsky was Stravinsky was instituted in Woody, in Woody Herman. I think they collaborated at some some time. But um, yeah, I'm uh, your music. Uh, I, I you made me think of something. Um, uh, when you write something, it's like a child. You know, it's like your kid. You write it and you're close to it. You know, and then you have to let it go. You play it. Okay, this is the way I see it. You know, but when you play it, uh, when you write it after that, you let it go into the world. I mean, somebody else is going. They might not play it the way you play it. They might not see it the way you see it. I mean, uh, I always preach to people, whether my students or or whomever, you know, you need to make this music your own. And that's one of the things that I learned from listening to Miles Davis and John Coltrane and people like that, that, you know, there are pieces that, you know, if you heard uh, pieces like Footprints, for instance, on Miles Smiles, you know, that was released first, you know, and you had to hear that, wow, that was like magic. And then when you heard Footprints on Adam's Apple, it wasn't the same. And still you liked the Miles one better. <laughs> You know, uh, but uh, uh, 
you you have to put your signature on the music and then so when you as a comp I mean I like to do that with other people's music so I can't say anything when other people do that with my music and I like to hear that only thing I like to know that if they know what what it what the right way the first way the way it was written first if they know that I could I could usually tell if they people don't you know they they got it out of fake book and just got it wrong that's one thing but if they know it and then you know they do another thing with it i really love it i mean i've heard some of my music I, i'm dying to hear how people do you know they take the time to do uh some pieces of mine um i, I love somebody else's uh, take on my pieces and i'm just thrilled when somebody uh, likes my music and enough to want to do it. Jeremy Pelter just recorded some uh, something. He did a great job, and I, I just thank him for that. You know, I love to hear that. What does jazz music mean to you? <laughs> That's a big question. Jazz music is my life. It's uh, how I try to live my life. I try to, you know, jazz is uh, how I think of, you know, like that improv impro improvisation. You never know what's going on from this moment to the next. Uh, but, you know, the more freedom you have, the more responsibility you have to, uh, you have to exercise. The extra goal, uh, uh, you know, Salvador Dali once said, uh, Salvador, somebody asked Salvador Dali if he used drugs, and he said, Salvador Dali used drugs. Salvador Dali is drugs. <laughs> you know? And I feel like, let's say Dexter Gordon, I think, 
is, you know, he didn't just play jazz, he is, he is jazz, he was jazz, and his music lives on, so he is jazz, you know, a way, you know, uh, his attitude uh, towards life is jazz, and I think mine is similar in that way, in that, uh, what, what happens on the bandstand, I learned from working together with people, working, and I mean, the way we are on the bandstand is the way I try to live my life, you know, uh, 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 and working with, with people, playing, making music with each other. It's a way to be, to really try to understand people and be intimate with people, you know, without getting in their way, allowing them to be themselves, allowing people to be themselves, helping, help, let, letting people be themselves, helping people to be themselves while you can be yourself too you know, and making this world a better place, you know. So, I mean, whatever hap was happening on that bandstand is what is happening for me in life. That's the way I try to look at life. And aside from, and I didn't say much about the music. I mean, the music, it's just joy, you know. That's jazz. I mean, music is, is I love more, more, than, more, more music than just jazz, but jazz is my life. Period, you know, that's that's. <laughs> I can't be any more. I, I maybe I could be more clear, but I mean that's really what it is. Jazz is my life. That's what music. That's what it means to me. Jazz music, it's my life. That'll do it again for another edition of the Pace Report, reporting live here at Smoke here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank Mr. George Gables for his time as well as the staff and management here at Smoke. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column, as well as my past segments. Until next time, remember, if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Until next time, peace.